So I just got done uh, listening to and watching a talk show live in my Apple Vision Pro, which was really cool. Um, kudos to the team for live streaming that in 3D. I thought that was a really clever idea and I think it was executed relatively well. Um, it was it was very immersive uh, to watch a live show in that headset, by the way. Uh, and it's very exciting thinking about the future of what live events could look like when they come to things in spatial computing and VR and AR. Um, I know a lot of people have talked about this, but I think one great thing about the Apple community is that it's relatively, I mean, as much as you can say this about a company as big as Apple, it feels very tight knit, right? And that a lot of the people who are um, passionate about commenting on the platform are also users of it. And many of them are also developers for it. And so there's a lot of like very creative cross collaborative events and uh, projects that get put together that end up with really amazing kind of moments like this, where you've got a brand new technology that uh, is cobbled together by a group of people that are all kind of just passionate about it and want to impress their friends and want to put on a fun show. And uh, that's all to say that it was really fun to see that talk show live uh, and feel a deeper sense of immersion with it than you would in like a 2D setting. It really felt like I was very present in, in that theater and watching the event. That said, I figured I'd comment on it um, because I knew that this was kind of today's, it felt like today's big event in terms of WWDC. Uh, it's a tradition that Gruber has going back, I don't even know how many years. And I think I've listened to, maybe not all, I mean, maybe not even the majority of, uh, or sorry, maybe not all of them, but I've listened to the majority of them. And uh, it's always one of the highlights of WD, WDC. It feels like it gives uh, the right people the right chance to kind of nerd out about the important parts. And, you know, as uh, Gruber has got more and more of the Apple executives uh, to, uh, to join in, it, it has just felt very natural to have them dive in deeper on the technical side of things and the behind the scenes and the inside baseball behind some of this stuff. It, it just feels um, like it's always very enlightening. So I wanted to comment on it, just kind of my big takeaways, uh, in particular as they kind of relate to both Vision OS and Apple Vision Pro, AI, and then Apple as a whole. Let me start with Vision Pro because it's relatively short. First one is that they kind of talked very briefly about the idea that Vision Pro is still very early on in its product trajectory. They compared it to the iPod, they compared it to the iPhone, and mentioned how it took several years for each of those platforms to get started. And I think it's a helpful reminder that platforms take a while to get off the ground. Um, it's just that sometimes things are seen as immediate winners, especially when they're solving a problem that's already pre-existing out there. Um, rather than serving as pure platform plays that uh, will get better incrementally over a much longer period of time and investment. Um, <laughs> I'm sure that you either watched or will watch or will watch again. Uh, but if you haven't seen Gruber's uh, um, talk show yet, first of all, you should go watch it. But second of all, um, one of the themes throughout it was patience. They kept talking about patience and I am a big fan of patience as a value. I know that Apple values patience as well. And um, they really wanted to remind those watching in the outside world that it is important to be patient when it comes to platforms. And that importantly, Apple is very good at being patient and that they do invest in their products long-term and that they see the products and things that they put out into the world as something that they've committed to and that will continue co to commit to. Now, it's not always true, but you compare it to someone like a Google or even a Facebook to some extent, and you can see the difference in philosophy between the, those uh, between Apple and those other companies. Um, and so they talked about Vision OS. They uh, talked about how, you know, um, really it as a platform is just meant to grow over time. Eventually, they moved on into um, Apple intelligence, AI stuff. And I just like, I have my notes here. I just kind of want to like look through them 
and just kind of give you my thoughts about what, what was said and wrap it up at the very end. I'll try and be quick. The first one is that I felt very validated that uh, they brought on, I think it's John Giandrea is how you pronounce his name. He's like head of ML or something like that, vice president ML. I, I don't know what his actual title is, but he, he is the, uh, I think he used to work at Google. He sort of spearheads that group within Apple, that technology. And uh, one of the first things that he said is that a big core design philosophy that they followed when it came to the technology was that they don't generate for you, basically, right? They only do a couple of things. He actually said that they summarize primarily, but they also he also implied that they do some translation. And I've said over and over again that those are the things that LLMs are good at. So I felt very validated in that. Um, <clears throat> it was interesting that when he was talking about that, he said that you know a big problem in the community for in the sort of natural language processing community for a long time was summarization. I remember this from my college days actually studying. Um, uh, a little bit of natural language. Uh, and he said, basically, LLMs have solved the summarization problem, which I think is very, very fascinating. He also said that there's two problems with LLMs, and I think it's the two that I've mentioned too. Um, one is actually, I think, is better articulated though. The first one, he says, was hallucination. LLMs hallucinate, we all know that. The second one is that he actually said it's kind of like safety is what they bucketed into. And they say like, you know, things that are inappropriate or bad Ill or illegal, not that they're going to stop it from happening, but that there's um, not necessarily any guardrails off uh, on that out of the box for an LLM. He, during that period, they mentioned how one of the ideas was that they didn't want to amplify bad things, right? Um, and this is really interesting given our discussion on this channel about superhuman interfaces and the bicycle of the mind, right? That the idea is that they don't want to um, sort of out of nowhere create something that is uh, inherently bad, right? They don't want the uh, uh, computer to have that type of agency. And in fact, a big core philosophy of theirs or core principle of theirs when it comes to this is the same core principle that they have when it comes to building PCs which is that the user has agency and that they have control, right? I'm a huge fan of that, just generally speaking. I think it's like not that controversial to say, but um, they talk about patience and they talk about agency. And I talk about the, those things as my, some of my core values that I align with. And so you can start to see why <laughs> I like Apple products so much that I think the company aligns with a lot of my, my values as well. Later on, um, let me see here. I think that later on, uh, they were talking uh, about some of those values too. And uh, I think it was Craig, sort of Craig Federighi, he was talking about how they literally had eth ethicists involved in sort of some of these discussions about what is, uh, what, what is right for an, uh, an LLM to do. And I think that, that was very informative to me, just like thinking about Apple as a company, right? that they are embedding these ethicists into their discussions and making sure that they're making decisions that are good for humanity uh, to the extent that they can, given the, the nature of the technology and the progression of technology, right? And um, they even mentioned that one of the things that they had done was post a blog post as well. Um, and it's one of those things that I definitely haven't had the time to read, but I will try and get, get read and summarize for this channel. But it gives just all of that discussion gave me a lot of respect for the thought behind what was going on here. And this is before we even got to the technology part. This is just from a sort of uh, ethical design philosophy perspective, right? Eventually, they started talking about private cloud compute, which I think was the most interesting technical discussion. You could tell that Craig was very excited to talk about it. And while I've been watching the kind of WWDC developer sessions throughout the day, I didn't realize uh, and I, how extensive some of the thought process was behind some of the, the systems design that they've done here, right? Especially when it comes to that private cloud compute which I think kind of universally by the by commentators and by the media and by other people who are technically minded uh, has been sort of universally praised as a very clever solution to the AI scaling problem. 
Um, one of the things that was most interesting to me, though, was just how much of these AI features run on device. And in fact, it was designed that way. Um, the same way that I feel like a, your phone, an iPhone, has like a supercomputer in your pocket, right? Um, you kind of now have a super intelligent, artificial intelligence that actually is also a part of the computer. Um, now, they definitely do farm some of that out to these private compute clusters, but the design work that they've done around that to ensure that that is secure and that it's not as secure as running it on your device, but very nearly as secure as running it on your device is very fascinating. And I think one of the most interesting parts of it was how they were talking about how they uh, cryptographically verify that the server that you're even connecting to is the right server, basically. All sorts of really clever tricks that they've, that they've put into the system. And importantly, that it is um, privacy pre preserving from the beginning and very importantly, that it's climate conscious from the beginning, uh, which I found very impressive all around. I know, big surprise. I think I, before I ramble on too long, I think my biggest takeaway was about the company as a whole though. Um, there's all sorts of other little things that I'm definitely gonna talk about. Is that I think coming into last year's WWDC and now this year's WWDC, there was two, there was a big question about Apple as a company as a whole, right? Last year's big announcement was the Apple Vision Pro. And the question was whether they could continue, whether Apple still had it in them to release new hardware platforms that are as good as their former hardware platforms, frankly, as, as good as their old computing uh, paradigms. And while Vision OS and the Apple Vision Pro have a long way to go, both as, as a platform and, as, and also as just products, I think a year in, it's safe to say that these, um, that their headset is uh, still in a lot of ways leading the pack um, as far as a consumer oriented device goes. I think that it is fair to say that it's clear that they are committed to the platform and that they are working on improving it in meaningful ways for the people who are currently using it. And as a user, I just want to frankly say that it's, it's a very fun product to use. Is it $3,500 worth of fun? Probably not, but um, I think that I, I've installed the beta on there now and the improvements even just in the beta are should show me the type of leaps and bounds that are gonna be happening over the next few years. Very similar to the early days of the iPhone where it felt like every year it was like, oh, these big things have changed and it's ex exciting to see kind of the new design paradigms and philosophies that they've brought into this uh, system. So that's all to say that a year into to Apple Vision Pro, I think that they are, there's a very strong evidence that Apple still got it. But still, there was a question coming into this event whether there was another paradigm shift coming in the form of AI and whether Apple still had it in terms of that. Now, if you've been watching this channel, you know that I've been posting videos uh, leading up to this event actually kind of with the prediction that Apple was probably gonna do the right things because they have a track record of it and they had all the right technologies to make it happen. I will st still say though, going into Monday, I wasn't a hundred percent sure that they were going to be positioned well. Like it wasn't, it was not a guarantee, right? You never know. After Monday, I had mixed feelings, uh, mostly positive, but still relatively mixed. But after tonight, after this this uh, uh, talk show, I am. I'm thoroughly convinced uh, about Apple's prowess here. And uh, I think it puts the onus on the rest of the industry to respond in some way, especially Google, right? Google should really have uh, a fire under their ass right now. And uh, I think that's because I, the things that they have announced are truly industry leading in many, many, many ways, right? Especially when it comes to the consumer space. Now. What Apple has done here is that they have both launched a computing paradigm when it comes to the Apple Vision Pro. A lot of their, their core values are embedded in that beautiful product, um, high quality, um, yeah, respect for the customer, 
deep thoughts about design, all of those things. When it comes to AI, I really think that they have also re released a new platform here as well, not in the same scale as the Apple Vision Pro, but in a way that confronts a paradigm shift that was possibly coming when it came to the way that we use our devices. If Apple had showed up this year and had given pretty much anything less than what they gave in this, this case, I think the, the question would still be up in the air. Uh, but because of this sort of robustness of what has happened and what they've announced, it gives me faith in the company uh, and their ability to execute on these deep paradigm shifting uh, events in the tech industry long after Steve Jobs um, has passed. I think someone in my comment section said it really well, which is that this Apple Vision Pro and now with Apple intelligence that we have now seen the true products, the fruits of the Tim Cook era of, uh, of Apple. And I think that's a perfect way of putting it, uh, that these two are going to be his two products that are have honestly the deepest legacy as far as like actual physical products go. And uh, he has opened up two computing platforms that will probably come together over a longer period of time and uh, keep Apple positioned very well when it comes to the consumer technology space. Now, huge asterisk on all of that because nobody's been able to really test Apple intelligence outside of Apple, but it is very rare that they, uh, that they first of all, release a product that is so far off of the claims that they make that it becomes ridiculous. This is, I really doubt this is gonna be a humane AI pin scenario, right? Or a rabbit R1 scenario. Uh, there is a brand on the line here. Like maybe the most valuable or at least one of the most valuable brands in the world. And I think that that's sort of the core of what I wanted to get at in this video, which is that Apple's brand means something, you know? Um, Gruber has talked about this before, about the sort of sacredness of an Apple logo and how they try not to overuse it. They don't sell merch with Apple logos on it. They don't do anything like that. They really treat it as a sacred piece of their company, right? The, the actual logo itself. That's because they want to put their logo on things that have meaning and provide that logo meaning, right? Because it's their brand. Not every company treats their brand with that level of carefulness, right? Some, some of them spend the political capital that their brand gives them to make a buck. Apple rarely does that. And so anytime you see that Apple next to something, or anytime you say the word Apple next to something, you should really think about the thought that went behind that, right? That's all to say that calling it Apple intelligence is a bold move. It's bolder than a lot of people gave it credit for, right? Um, I think that in this in yesterday's episode of the Accidental Tech Podcast that Syracuse was mentioning that Apple's a values-driven company, right? <laughs> their, their values and their business model align and they like to communicate their decisions to their customers because their values also align with their customers. And so it's this sort of very zen-like, beautiful way of aligning customers' interests, Apple's interests, and Apple's values. So that there's a straight line from one to the other and uh, that is what gives Apple's brand meaning, right? One of those things, one of those values is patience, right? Patience and hustle, for instance, related to that patience. Another one is design and attention to detail, right? Another one is respect for the user, respect for the user's agency. And I could keep going down the laundry list of things here, but the point is that with the two paradigm shifts of spatial computing and artificial intelligence or large language models, I think you see, have now, we have now seen enough to know that Apple still's got it and um, that frankly, they have positioned themselves to be very successful for many, many years to come. 